Hare Guru Ganesha Mahasaya. Start with a few words here. Um, I guess on behalf of Matsilla, myself, Stephen, and myself, uh, we'd like to thank Elizabeth uh, Zane's no longer with us, but uh, obviously thank you to him to first of all introducing us to all this stuff back. I'm going to say June, July, right, Professor? Yeah, Somewhere back then. Yeah. This, yep, yep. uh, this is almost a full full trip around the sun adventure. Um, so I appreciate uh, Luke, Chris, and I know Elizabeth is uh, somewhere with us um, as we kind of share some of these early insights into kind of what the first group did. And more importantly, I think um, what this means for the second group and going forward. Um, so uh, we'll uh, start with Matsilla just to give a little bit of an uh, understanding of what, what went on in the backside of all of this. Matsilla, I think you're muted. Thank you very much, everyone. Yes, now I'm, I'm good. Um, thank you very much, uh, Luke, and uh, hello. Thank you very much. Um, so I'll just start off by, so just a moment. I'll just start off, I'll just start off by providing a brief description of pretty much what the project entailed, at least from our perspective. Um, what we aimed to understand from it, as well as pretty much just detail a bit of our work through uh, to where we are currently, but first in terms of understanding and then in terms of tools and implementations that we actually used throughout the process. So initially the project was supposed to be uh, an analysis of Ethereum, a state analysis of I put it that way, know, knowing quite well that Ethereum is a, a state virtual machine. Um, so therefore we, utilized a lot of uh, so software or programming languages, first of all, to understand the structure of the data, to actually access the data and under try to understand the structure of the data. Um, that, in that include, as you see here, Python, um, which was pretty much one of the key, the key tools we used uh, just to analyze the data throughout the entire project. Um, Google BigQuery being one of the easiest um, uh, depositories to actually access some of the data from which we used and then yahoo finance amongst others uh which is uh, an easier uh, uh high low close uh, volume price data sort of uh database that's a lot easier to access for timestamp data sets so this is pretty much um, an overview in terms of what we looked at and this is this may not be as um this may not seem as broad since there's a lot of data sources that exist. However, we mentioned these as these were the key ones. Um, pretty much our key key focus here would be um, seeing what, what interpretations we may use using the tools we have for financial engineering into understanding of um, Ethereum and exploratory, our exploratory analysis of Ethereum. Um, and then pretty much from that, we'll just conclude of what what all this analysis pretty much means about the ecosystem or what we've gained in terms of understanding of the ecosystem, as well as if there's anything that could be translated into, I'd say our current financial market and how we understand it. This being just wearing the financial engineering hat. So I'll move on. Um, this is effectively not completely as accurate, but pretty much provides a bird's overview of how we access the data and pretty much gives you sort of a staged, staged walkthrough in terms of um, our process throughout the entire, the entire project. So you have the Ethereum uh, chain, uh, which, which has pretty much the, the data sets that you might need. This is on-chain data, as well as you have the, the crypto, the, the, the Ethereum, the Ether uh, uh, data sets as well within there. So there's, there's different ways of accessing this. Like I, previously mentioned, you have your different APIs, which are usually the, the most preferred to methods by most, um, by most people, because it's just a lot easier to access them uh, through Python. And then you have a Python log parser. Now, this is where I actually went deep into uh, a bit of a rabbit hole in this project, because um, pretty much there's a, there's a log parser that's, with, that's, that's found in Python that pretty much allows you to actually interface with, I think Luke mentioned it as well the last time, that allows you to effectively interface with a node and try to get data out of that. So pretty much 
these two API and the uh, a pass of, of the log data sets pretty much provides, uh, in my understanding, just an overview segmentation of the different types of data sets you might be looking at when you look at this particular problem. And then obviously you would have a, a deposit or a repository of where to store the data sets. Um, the key things here is that um, there's two divergent ways in which you could you could have viewed the pro the the which you could have viewed this particular project. Um, you could have effectively looked at just pricing data, pricing and volume data of Ether, and be like, okay, what is the what is the ETH price going like? Um, how can we analyze this? What does this mean for us? Maybe from a training perspective. And then you could have also have went deeper into smart contract lock data sets, which is something I explored myself um, doing. Um, and the different uh, various ways in which you could effectively have conducted an analysis of this is um, using reinforcement learning, which we'll talk to later on, various neural networks and neural architecture search methodologies, um, which are well documented in um, in literature, like in academic literature, as well as just log and price visualizations um, as, as a simple as simple tools to look at this. So I hope this just provides a context of um, where our journey throughout the entire, the entire project and each single part of it um, has been a considerate, a considerate uh, learning path. So I'll move on to um, the particular section I went for. So the particular section I went for uh, for this particular for this particular problem is to actually present to you uh, an Ethereum uh, trading case study. Um, this is based off of this is pretty much a transfer learning approach based off of uh, a classification algorithm that's was actually that's been used on uh, a Bitcoin. And the understanding was just to try to find uh, to try to find to try to determine whether or not the very same strategies that that could that are, that can be applied in one currency uh, in one crypto such as bitcoin can actually be effective in another um so effectively what i did uh, in this particular in this particular uh, case study is that initially the first time i just used a blind online learning algorithm for portfolio selection however it seemed that the the results that came out were really not as interpretable so this in this particular instance uh I had, I had a look at a classification-based supervised learning algorithm that effectively used um, that effectively use a, a random forest type of classification uh, uh, algorithm in terms of uh, classifying uh, uh, trades in, in, in terms of uh, buy or hold, like buy or hold strategy. And the manner in which this was done was in terms of uh, segmenting the data into a uh, short-term price uh, rolling average and a long-term price, and then comparing the two to effectively be able to determine whether or not um, you know you should buy or you should sell, uh, or whether or not the the data set in itself aggregates that you have more buys or more selling uh, uh, signals within it. Um, so effectively, I'll just speak to this, um, speak to the higher level methodology that uh, the, the method employs, and then just speak to the results that I got and the conclusions that um, pretty much uh, came from it. So just having a bird's eye overview of, of the <clears throat> a bird's overview of the current pricing data from 2017 to 2021, we effectively realized that uh, the closing price as well as the volume weighted price seem to track each other quite well. Um, from this particular data set, we're able to infer as well that throughout the data set using the methodology that I just explained that's used within the algorithm of, 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 of comparing a, a daily rolling average, um, we notice that you actually have way more buy signals. You have a significant number of buy signals in comparison to short signals, which is what the, uh, which is what's, uh, reflected by the, the two bar charts uh, with the zero and one segmentation. Moving forward. Um, so usually when applying these kind of methodologies, um, accuracy is, is, a, is a big factor within, within the particular, particular implementations. And in this particular implementation of the random forest, if we have just have a look at the confusion matrix, um, it effectively, uh, it, effect, it, it effectively uh, portells that us that um, in terms of accuracy, the implementation within the data should be correct, uh, should be as, as a high accuracy. Like if you sum up the entire the entire um, 
quadrants in the in the, in the in the matrix and then divide by and then some if you sum up the entire quadrants within the matrix and then sum up the two deeply shaded diagonals within the matrix that should give you a bit of a, an accuracy measure which went out to roughly 95 percent when using the algorithm so that says that within implementation of the algorithm it seemed to be accurate um, in terms of in, in terms of providing a, a signal going forward and the, the comparative side on the right side provides um, a bit of an overview of some of the basket of basket of uh, algorithms that could have been used, classification algorithms that could have been used. And within the algorithm, the reason that the, the random forest was chosen was, was mainly at the back of the fact that it is an ensemble uh, uh, algorithm that pretty much entails uh, sampling as well as factor uh, uh, feature, feature sampling. So the reason this is important is that in order to effectively utilize this, uh, there will be a sampling methodology, but one key area is also that you're able to take note of features that you think might describe the data sets. These, these include your moving averages, your stochastic oscillators, or any momentum-based uh, methodology. So the random forest seemed uh, a reasonable uh, use case in this side. Um, going forward, um, however, uh, after applying the methodology, we found I found that the the results were a bit spurious in this context. Um, you have um, you have the understanding would have been that given the accuracy level that was depicted by application of the algorithm within the Ethereum, with like that the at the with such a high accuracy there, the understanding at the basal level would have been that you would expect uh, the strategy and the actual returns to actually track each other quite perfectly. However, this was not the case in this instance. And so it begs two questions, which are takeaways in this particular instance, which will also be tied into our, my, my colleague's presentation. One key one is uh, whether accuracy was actually uh, a perfect measure for, for the model. And then a second one, which is of much critical, is also uh, the data, data, the data size that we're using within uh, within the model. So the overarching implementation of this just shows that um, applying a supervised learning sort of approach, um, which inherently has a lot of assumptions in it, does not necessarily fit does not necessarily fit or perform well on on the data sets, and which is a huge takeaway going forward, regardless of any implementation going forward. Um, and therefore, which is why we usually we will then turn to other unsupervised uh, algorithms such as the reinforcement learning algorithms, which my colleagues will talk about later. Um, you can go on, Brian. So, as Matilda just prefaced, right, the big question here is can we treat these tokens um, as an equity? At the end of the day, we're trying to make money, um, buying, selling, um, and treating these like another financial instrument in any other portfolio. Um, and the question is, can we? The big, the big question is, can we? Um, so the, the case study that I took on is, is, is understanding really what the underlying characteristics of a token may look like, right? So in an equity, we have, you know, the volume, um, we have maybe like an EV EBITDA measure, um, and we have, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we don't necessarily have that, but we have thing we can, we can track, tr um, transact the amount of transaction, who's transacting, the amount of transactions um, to and from receipts of a specific, of a specific transaction. Um, and we can also see how much, uh, um, how much money is in a specific smart contract over time. So though not similar to, though, though not exactly the same as equities, they're very similar characteristics that can be traced over time and in turn could possibly provide insights into how these things move. So the case study I took um, is, a, is a famous coin, um, Chainlink, right? Um, they're a provider of a decentralized um, network connecting real world data, um, to smart contracts. Um, simply put, um, a smart contract um, doesn't know anything outside of the smart contract in the chain. Um, so, in more and more, in more and more use cases, we see um, the need to be bringing in outside world data, making some comparison, and then actioning um, on chain um, with that data. So. Here's a perfect visual. Uh, on the next slide, we'll see visualizations of exactly how this works and why it's important. Um, and so the question is here, right? 
with a growing number of smart contracts requiring off-chain data, right? Is there, is there a financial value to it? Um, and if there is, what does that look like over time? Um, and in turn, right, if we're going to be implementing the strategies that Matilla or Stephen are going to be, or Stephen will talk about, Matilla has talked about, right? What's the inherent risk of holding this stuff? Um, aside from this, right, you see, you see it in the news. Um, as much as, you know, it could be a meme, maybe not. Um, things like Doge, things, uh, you know, early days of, of Bitcoin, right? What is what is the true risk of holding this stuff when, when it comes from financial from a financial perspective? Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so here, just a basic um, understanding uh, for those listening um, who are not familiar with Chainlink. Very simply, Chainlink is kind of the middleman between what's going on in the chain and everything outside of it. So we have a lot of data, the basic examples, right? PayPal, Bloomberg, external APIs, um, and converts that data into on-chain uh, on -chain actionable um, information uh, that the smart contracts could actually work on, right? So the question is that this middle step, right? What's the value of that? Um, and obviously there's, there's a there's a token that can be traded and bought and used to to be able to um, to pay for the service. So uh, next slide, please. So what I did is I took a very very early segment of of Chainlink. Um, right now right now the token sits at like forty five and a half dollars. Um, but using BigQuery and some Python magic, basically what I was able to do is I was to pull, I was able to pull data direct uh, pull pull the BigQuery data into Python um, and because of the size of the data, right? So you have every single transaction, every single volume to from address, um, the gas prices, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The data is really massive to be pulling it for five years of information, right? So I took a subset of it just to basically give us an idea or, and or sort of develop a methodology to be able to do these exact analyses. Um, so really the time of this doesn't really matter. More importantly, it's uh, the methodology. So again, back to the point of what does this mean for, you know, understanding this as, uh, as, as you would any other, any other equity, any other stock, right? So we have returns of the length, right? We have prices and all this, and we do see these spurs of volatility in uh, mid, mid 2019, towards the end of 2019 and in the beginning days, right? So from a supply demand perspective, automatically um, prices are shooting up because probably more people are transacting. Um, and if you go to the next page, uh, the next slide here, You'll see that exact relationship, right? Transactions are blowing up, prices are going up. Very similar to something you would see on an equity. Uh, more demand, more trading volume, there's going to be volatility. Um, and the volume per day mimics the exact same thing. Um, so let's go to the next page. Um, so what do we do with this volume of transaction data? Well, we know that the, the those uh, that those two characteristics are um, are positively uh, correlated, right? So the question is, can we create a factor model similar to Fama French, where we try to express the returns of a particular equity, or in this case, the token, um, as a sum of factors. Um, and so specifically, Fama French use small minus big, uh, so market cap, and then, um, so the five factor model is profitability, market sensitivity, um, among others. Um, and so the question here is, can we create something similar using these exact, uh, you, not the exact, but the same type of procedure, right? So if I'm a French one, um, a Nobel Peace Prize, I will not be winning a Nobel Peace Prize for this specific model, but the idea is there, right? So um, as we can see to on, on the graph on the right, right, the predicted returns and the actual returns over a 10 day period, uh, this is not a forecast merely, this is a back test, right? So the question is, is how, given a, given a historical set, how does the model overlay it? And obviously here we, uh, this specific model does not have significantly statistic, uh, statistically significant factors per se, uh, but that doesn't mean this is absolutely useless. What this means is we know that there's a positive, there's most likely a positive, uh, a positive, a positive sensitivity is what I'm going to refer to it as between transaction count and volume, um, which, which confirms what we saw in the previous slide. Um, 
though that may not seem that like anything new, right? This is kind of a formalized step that needs to be taken to then understand that these move like equities. And if it moves like equities, that opens a whole realm of possible analysis, which we'll see in the next slide here. So the next steps for a model like this uh, would be to develop a, a beta, right? So what, what, what sensitivity does a specific token have to an index or a market, right? Um, and that's kind of self-defined for the user. Um, in equities, for example, right? How does, let's say, a specific stock move to the S&P 500, right? How does, in this case, how would a specific token maybe move to an associated index? So there's definitely something to investigate here. Um, and additionally, um, an idea uh, to remove kind of the free, the, the free return, right? Risk-free return from our analysis. Um, I guess the less noise you have in here, the better. Um, and so establishing this idea of risk-free um, and what that really means in the context of, a, of, of the crypto space is another idea to investigate to further develop this model here. Let's move to the next slide. Um, so the, kind of building off of what, um, what Matilla built for us and explained is volatility, right? We saw um, when I explained the price, when a couple slides ago, when we looked at the pricing, when uh, looked at the pricing data and, and the returns over time, we see these shocks. Um, I'm not going to call them random. There's definitely um, some kind of inherent pattern to it, um, but it is stochastic, right? So there, there is some randomness to it. And the question is, how do we model the vol? What is what does the volatility of this thing look like? What does it look like over time? And more important, if we're going to trade and hold this in, in sort of a portfolio or on behalf of clients, right? What's the value at risk? Um, what what does a day to day risk portfolio look like for an asset like this? Um, so, like any other equity, like at, at, at any quant desk, at any bank or financial institution, right? A quantitative uh, conditional uh, volatility model, more more formally known as an arch or a garch model. Um, I'm happy to get into the mathematics, but kind of for the for the ease and flow of the presentation, we'll kind of leave that to a minimum. Um, but in essence, what, 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 what are we trying to do? Well, um, what we'll try to do is we'll try to express the returns of a token as a function of a mean, so some kind of mean return, plus um, some kind of random level of volatility or shock, right? So if you go to the next, we'll go to the next slide here. So what we have here is a, is, a, is a historical VAR analysis and why, why this is important, we'll get to. Um, but in essence, um, what, what we, the, as we can see on uh, the image to, uh, on the right side, um, so we have a white line and we have a, of a yellow line. Um, and then we have a bunch of this black, black noise underneath. Um, so when we go to fit our, when we go to model the returns of our token, right? The, the errors between what we actually modeled and what actually happened, right? These, we'll call them errors or residuals for, for mathematical formality, um, are, as, are a function of the standard deviation um, times some kind of random, random standardized shock, more, more formally known as white noise, where the variance of the current errors is a function of previous errors. Um, and again, this random shock. Um, so once we, once we formalize all that mathematics and make it look pretty and all, um, in essence, wh why, why do we need this? Well, we have an estimate of expected, expected volatility. And if we have expected volatility, we can calculate um, kind of bands, uh, a, um, a confidence band on where we think, where we think tomorrow's tomorrow's movement is going to be right so in essence what we do is we create um we create a distribution of all possible volatilities on a given trading day and we take the extreme five percent and the extreme one percent and as you can see that value and that that, that cumulative distribution it well the, the associated cumulative distribution is plotted um on the uh, on the the blue and the yellow line respectively at the one and five percent levels um and so the, the the reason we use this is we say, well, if the movement on a specific trading day is exceeding the 5% level or the 1% level, well, then there's a 95 or 99% chance of losing that amount or more on a given day, right? 
So taking chain link data, um, this, is, this is the same data as you saw um, on the previous slides. Um, using this analysis, we have 27 days, 27 trading days um, where we have an exceedance. So what does that mean? Well, 27, so almost a month of time, month of trading days, the volatility, the possible volatility, because this is this is this is a probability of losing, right? So possible, the the possibility of losing was so extreme um, that it basically is caused is, is crossing a threshold of what's acceptable. So interpreting this, uh, for example, would mean that, um, for example, uh, take any point here, um, and we can say if if it did if like let's let's. Um, Take that point all the way on the right, and we would interpret that as uh, let's call that 10 basis points. Um, so we have a 95% chance of losing 10 basis points on a given day. So let's say um, you invest $100, 50 basis, you, 10 basis points of $100 is at stake um, with 95% certainty. Um, so obviously, the bigger the the bigger the portfolio, the more red flags you have, um, the more money in it you have, the more is at stake here. So why is this important? Aside from physically losing <laughs> losing assets and losing capital, um, I want to connect this to kind of what ETC2 is doing in the idea of front running a trade. Um, so we can look at these VAR patterns and possibly begin to develop some kind of reversion algorithm where we say, if yesterday we law we expect to lose X, and historically, you know, after losing X, we rebound to Y, um, can we create a strategy where we forecast that out and then trade on kind of the off days of when we think we're going to be losing. Um, so that's kind of what I did. Um, I think this is important in the context of financial risk management, obviously, um, but more from a practical perspective. Um, if, it, if you're just more than hold, if, if an institution is holding a significant amount of capital, or if it's if it's an actual institution and not just you know folks holding this on Binance on their phones, um, what does this really mean? Um, so I'll we'll hand it over to Steven to talk about his, uh, his RL. Thanks. Next page, please. Um, as Brian said, the ultimate goal is to trade token as equities. So I explore the reinforcement learning in trading for this project. And I'm going to introduce the reinforcement learning and talk about how to use it to generate optimal policy for trading cryptocurrency. So first of all, what is a reinforcement learning? When we say reinforcement learning, we are really describing a problem, not a solution. And this problem consists of four elements. They are states, actions, transaction function, and reward function. State is what you input to the model. Action is what you can do under different states. And reward function defines the reward that the model would get under different situation. And in the next page, I will use an example to illustrate how to solve a reinforcement learning problem. So let's say there is a robot in the room. On oh, next page, please. So let's say there is a robot in the room too right now. And we want to train it so that it can go outside by itself. In this case, the state of the problem is the location of the robot. And the action is how the robot moves. The star position is two and the goal room is five. We can represent this room on a graph. Each node represents the room and each door is a link. Because our goal room is five, we can give it a reward of 100 if the robot goes to the room five and you, and you will not get any reward in other situation. Next page, please. <clears throat> First, we need to initialize this Q table as a zero matrix. The row represent the starting room and the columns represent the next room. Each time the robot makes a move, the matrix Q will be updated. Once the robot reaches room five, we finish the episode and the robot has learned then update the matrix Q. Then we put it back to room two and go through this process again and again. After hundreds of time of iteration, the matrix Q will reach convergence values. It means that the optimal policy is learned and the robot can use this Q matrix as a guidance to go to the room five in the optimal path. And according to this Q matrix, we know that the optimal path is 2315. So this is how reinforcement learning algorithm can be used to solve a real problem. 
Next, I will show you how to use it to generate a algo trading policy. I implement this algorithm in the demo of our library. Um, to use it, all we need is to import this library and then call the function train API to train the model. This function takes in two parameters. The first one is the clean data, and the second one is the epoch. Epoch is the number of times that the learning algorithm will work through the entire training data set. And here, the model is trained to trade a sine wave, which is a normal way to test an algorithm. After we run the code, a trading strategy will be learned by the model, and we can use this model to generate trading orders and backtest the policy. To visualize this backtest uh, back result of the trading strategy, we can call the function test API, which takes in the test data set and the model we just got. Next page, please. This is the result I got by backtesting the uh, trading strategy. We can tell that the algo picks it up pretty well. The return is four times higher than the benchmark, which is the return you get if you just buy and hold it. But still, there are several ways to improve the result. The first way to increase the num is to increase the number of epochs. Next page. This is the result I got when I changed the number of epochs from 5,000 to 10,000. The total return is higher and the meaningless actions are less. And instead of adjusting the hyperparameter of the model, we can also improve the model by using some statistically significant factors. Next page. And this is what I got by using different factors. We can tell that the result is way better than the last one. So this is how we can use a reinforcement learning model to learn the trading policy. The market is way more complex than the sine wave. The main point here is to show the framework of how of using this algorithm and show some result I got. So what does all this mean? Um, first of all, thank you, Stephen and Matilla. Um, the, the the main question that I had and that I was really interested in personally is can, can these things be modeled like equities and as you can see there's a star right there. Um, yes, for the most part, no. So it's kind of a judgment right and at the at the end of the day, um, if proper mathematical um, procedures are used um, if proper statistics are used checking for stationarity checking for proper data um, proper cleaning, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera, um, these things can be modeled um, similarly. Um, and as I mentioned, proper data retrieval, final, it, it's, this is not really breaking news, um, but I guess it was back in, uh, back in June when I first downloaded one of these data sets and took a look at them. Um, cleaning is important to having actionable insights and Matilla and Steven can definitely account for that. Um, Next steps is I'm definitely interested in taking a look for ETC2 kind of can we front run value at risk data um, and see if there's a reversion, um, if there was a reversion pattern to extreme trading days. Um, can we buy when it's really low? Um, can we buy basically can we, can we buy in a dip and go be in and be in and out before another one occurs. Um, and as I also mentioned early in the presentation, uh, continue developing that factor model. Um, I think that's definitely something of interest when it comes to very simple, simple and quick analysis of what can and historically why has it happened. Um, I bet Steve, uh, Steven, as Steven mentioned, um, continuing to develop the RL algorithm um, to trade these things, um, though complex um, model tuning is in essence an optimization problem that can be solved. Um, when, when an algorithm's like this, it does require some serious GPU and computer power, but you know, in today's day and age, these are things that are widely available if kind of you, you uh, if you have the know-how. Um, and Matilla, as Matilla said, right, y we can deploy all these fancy algorithms, but a pure village visualiza visualization um, and having a dashboard to very easily see these things um, without having to write lines and lines of code um, is definitely a, a takeaway that is useful for any type of analytic, not specific to this, but really when it comes to trying to, trying to gain and understand something that, that you've never seen before, um, sort of the idea of developing up a dashboard is something, is something that's uh, of interest in the next steps. 
Um, I guess we'll open it up for questions, thoughts, concerns, um, and if Matilda and Stephen have anything else to add, uh, feel free. Yeah, I think, uh, th thank you very much, Brian. I think just a, a bit of an add on in terms of just the work we've been doing and what we gained from the project. I think one of the most, uh, outside of looking at the tokens like equities, one other interesting yet similarly challenging aspect is actually delving into the logs data sets of the various uh, contracts. I think um, venturing into that space can also lead to a lot of insights, um, though it, it, it can be a bit of a, a tedious process, I might say, um, finding the most optimal uh, tools to be able to do that. But um, having ventured into that direction a bit uh, while, during the learning process, I, I actually realized that um, uh, over and above the equities as we have done, uh, looking at uh, the different log data sets and the relations in between for different smart contracts can actually also provide a much, much greater insight as well. So that's that's been one takeaway. And that actually translates even into the normal financial market that we're in right now, that an analysis of um, the logs of any system pretty much seems to provide a, a greater, a, a significant level of detail on certain insights. So. Um, that's something I would just like to uh, close off with as well. I don't know whether Stephen has anything to add as well. To do uh, this new project? Yeah. Uh, no questions come to mind just yet, but that was a yeah, really great presentation, guys. That was really, uh, really interesting. Um, there's a few things I want to dive into a little bit further on my own to uh, understand a little bit better. Um, so I was taking notes. Uh, but uh, yeah, overall, it looks for, uh, We'll be happy to send you the, the, the notes or whatever, background information that they can. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Um, uh, it was quite nice to see some of the stuff because I don't have an economics background. But, uh, I see how all this can form together. And uh, you also opened my eyes uh, on some stuff. Uh, I, I have. Uh, I don't have specific questions because we tend to do questions on emails or whatever. If I'm allowed to do that, of course, no, no. Uh, this is because this was done for ETC, so uh, you certainly have access to it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, congrats on that, and uh, I'm sure that uh, you will use those tools, or at least uh, you are capable to use any tools. Uh, on your future. And uh, since since we have Karen here um, uh, for ETC2, Karen, can you can you hear us? Yeah. Great. Um, you know, it would be nice if you could utilize a little bit what these guys have done uh, as you uh, take it forward during the summer. Yes. Yeah, so and the fall as a capstone as well. Right. 